I've always enjoyed and spent a good deal of time analysing maps. And with the advent of the internet, we can now marvel at the amount of additional information that animation bestows. Even better when it's possible not just to see information in real time, but to contribute with a data feed of my own. In this video, we will follow the steps involved in building a small detector, connecting it to the internet and inserting live data into a living map. In this way, my readings can be shared and combined to augment a global monitoring system, often referred to as citizen science. The project chosen here is the air quality system at Sensor Community. The current homepage includes an animated map and a wealth of living links to open data with a mission to inspire and enrich people's lives. It's a platform for the collectively curious that is genuine, joyful and positive. It also has plenty of invitations to build your own. So let's see what's involved. Given the preceding introduction, it behoves us to draw a road map of the route charted in this video. We will start with the cost, as this is not a sales pitch. The costs are low, as most of the hard work has already been done and continues in the background. The cost of high technology is falling, and what price can you really place on a fun education? We will then look at the hardware options and how each element operates. We will look at the software, how to download it from the internet and upload it onto your system, how to join the various communities able to support and help with any problems, how to connect your device and test the updated data, and finally, where to go from here. Links are on the site to point to a supplier where you can purchase a complete kit of parts for about £50. Should you wish just to tinker, then there are really only five items that are shown later. These designs generally fall under the heading of the Internet of Things, or IoT. A thing on the internet only needs five elements. A. Inputs, some kind of sensor or sensors. B. Outputs, something to provide some kind of remote control, called actuators. C. Some processing ability, a microcontroller or microprocessor. D, communications, and E, some kind of power supply. The detailed design considered here looks like this. First are the sensors, a temperature, pressure, and humidity sensor. These are all combined in a single unit, which due to their very high general usage are supplied in a single small unit with the dimensions of a small pill. The choice here is the BME 28D. The second sensor is much larger. The one selected for this project is the SDS-011. It contains a laser detector and a small fan to circulate the sampled air around the inside of the unit. This IoT design does not have any outputs. There are many options for the processing capability. The Arduino and the Raspberry Pi are candidates, but in this instance, a device called a Node MCU has been selected. It's supplied as a very small unit that also contains the communications function, Wi-Fi. A separate power supply may be used, but here it can be dispensed with, as the whole thing can be programmed and powered via the USB port, probably connected to the machine that you're using to view this video. An overview of the process we're about to follow looks like this. A micro USB lead is used to connect and power the node board. Depending upon the combination of node board and operating system that you're using, you will need to first install the code that allows you to program the node board. With this installed, the firmware is then downloaded from the web and flashed onto the node MCU. Flashing is a special process that ensures the device does not lose the program and is ready to run once the node MCU is powered up once again. Once reset, the firmware causes the Node MCU to become a small or soft standalone web server accessible using a tablet or mobile using Wi-Fi. Once associated, the particular settings of your device may be entered and saved before the power is removed. The sensors may now be connected and the power restored. The web page previously seen using the Wi-Fi connection should now be seen on your local network, but this time the Node MCU can also connect to the internet. It's now time to set up an account in the cloud based at Sensors Community. Once your application is approved, you may register a device. Once completed, data from your device appears on the map and you can bathe in the warm glow of success. That's the general route. Now let's consider the particular options. This page contains the details we are going to follow. 
The three major components here are the node MCU, the particle detector, and the temperature pressure humidity detector. It's remarkable that the sensor is this small metal device. It's so small that it has to be mounted on a large PCB with these pins for connections, but I digress. This assembly process covers two types of node MCU, the current version 3 and an earlier version 2. It also covers three operating systems, Linux, Mac and Windows. First, connect the node MCU to your machine using a mini USB cable. The onboard LED should flash briefly by way of encouragement. The next step is to download and install the correct driver for your combination of operating system and version of node MCU. Three options are available for Windows, two for Mac, and none for Linux, as it's perfect. Clicking on these two allows you to save a copy of a zipped file. The Windows 10 version 3 option led me to a blank page that I needed to right click in and reload to initiate the download. Similar steps are required for the two versions offered for the Mac. Extract the zip file and run the setup program described. It appears that the Mac installation requires a restart of the machine. Each operating system now has a driver in place. Next, a program called Firmware needs to be downloaded from the internet and uploaded to the Node MCU. This firmware is a program that is also referred to as a pre-compiled binary. It needs to be flashed onto the Node MCU. Flashing ensures that the firmware is loaded and ready to run, even after the power has been removed and then restored. Clicking on the flashing tool reveals this page. Another choice needs to be made here. The versions are shown as this column of numbers. Use the latest here, which is version 0.3.2. For Windows 10, use this option, even though it's referred to as AMD64. It works fine on Intel processors too. Earlier versions of Windows require this option, but the question has to be asked, why are you using an outdated operating system? For the Mac, select this option. For Linux, there are two options. This is for Ubuntu and this for Fedora. Linux users always know what they're doing and really don't need me to help here. By clicking your selected link, the process of downloading the firmware is initiated. Your system may well throw up a security warning at this point. It's quite right to do so. You should only do this from sources you really trust. trust in me. Open the app once it's downloaded. This screen should appear. From the top pull down, select the port that is connected to your node MCU. If there's more than one option and you're unsure as to which port to select, make a note of the options available. Close the program, disconnect the node MCU and restart the program. The option you required is the device that has now disappeared from the list. Close the program, reinsert the node MCU and reopen the program to select the option that by now should have reappeared. In this box below, select the latest bin or the one to suit your language option. Then press upload. If all is well, the green progress bar should extend to 100% to produce yet another warm feeling of success. Each device has a unique ID code that is displayed here. You may wish to make a note of it for later. Linux users should follow these permissions and Mac users have the option of a musical interlude by opening this YouTube video. Now is the time to remove the power and connect the sensors as shown. Once connected, reapply the power. Now, this is the time to configure your device. As a temporary measure, the Node MCU has configured its Wi-Fi connection into what is called a soft access point. This is a small private access point that has no internet access. It's also running a web server, a tribute to what may be achieved with such a small device. Using a suitable device with Wi-Fi capability, a tablet, mobile phone or a laptop, scan for nearby Wi-Fi activity. Your proximity should ensure that the signal appears to be very strong. Connect or associate, as the technical phrase has it, and enter http colon slash slash 192.168.4.1 into a web browser. Android users should note this advice if the connection repeatedly fails. This web-based configuration screen should appear. All that has to be done here is to inform the node NCP of your local router and password settings. Enter these and scroll to the base of the page and press save to save the settings. The node MCU will then reboot, leaving you disconnected as its soft access point disappears. If all has gone well, the node NCU has become a client on your local router. 
it now has the warm glow as it can now communicate via the internet. This is the end of the first part of the Node MCU configuration. The configuration web page of your Node MCU should now be visible on your local network. You can use an IP scanner to find its address or log into the configuration settings of your router to see a list of the IP addresses that it's allocated. Here is mine and these two test devices used for this video. Note your IP address and enter it into your browser to see the full configuration screen. We can take a quick tour of this configuration site. First, select the configuration option to reveal this page. This is the page that was used in the earlier Wi-Fi configuration where the router and password were entered. The other three tabs displayed here are More Settings, Sensors and API. More Settings should confirm your details. Note the value shown here in the sample delay setting. It is set at a reasonable value, but does show that you have to be patient when waiting for the system to burst into life later on. Sensors display this screen, and here you may have to divert slightly from the defaults. This option is the particle sensor we've been using, the SCS0011. But I had to check this BME280. Note the BMP280 is a similar sensor, but does not produce a pressure output. Once selected, press this Save Configuration and Restart button to record any changes you make. There will be a delay of a few seconds as the Node MCU reboots. My default API's configuration is currently this. More advanced details will be investigated in future videos. Current data and sensor information tabs produce these screens. We will return to the other options shortly. Our local sensor is now connected and operating. It's now time to configure the other end in the cloud to see our data appear. There are two stages to cloud configuration. The first is to set up an account and the second is to register your device and hopefully devices. Setting up an account is relatively simple. Head for devices.sensor.community and complete the entries. Your reply to a confirmation email completes the process and another warm sensation appears as you're welcome to the community. Welcome. Click on My Sensors and then Register Sensor to prepare the system to receive your output correctly. Let's have a quick tour of the registration page. This sensor ID is an important value. It's the sensor number mentioned earlier in the firmware upload section. It can be confirmed by going back to the local web server sensor page. Just enter the number. The default sensor board option ESP8266 is correct, but look at what other devices can be used. Basic information should be completed. As the note says, only the sensor ID is published. Check the indoor sensor until you've hardened your installation to sit outside, where it's really doing its job. Additional notes includes notes about the meaning of each entry. And finally, another important section headed Hardware Configuration. The current default sensor type is acceptable as SDS0011, but the second entry may need changing. If you've been following this video, use the pull down and select the BME280. I had unexpected errors caused by my mistake entering the BMP280 at this point. Finally, location. There are three methods of entering location. The first is just to enter the latitude and longitude in decimal format. The second is to zoom in and place the marker at the correct location in the map. And the third is beautiful. Just click the look up entered address. The map immediately zeroes in on your location. Delightful. Once you're happy, click on the save settings. A method of checking on what is happening in the background is to return to the device web page and the debug option. Click on this and select maximum info option. Now, do remember the reading delay mentioned earlier. This was less than three minutes, but can feel like an eternity as you wait for some confirmation to appear. You can increase the sampling frequency for testing, but do reduce it to a reasonable level when correct operation is proven. Otherwise, the server could be swamped with information. This screen shows the details of the system when it's operating correctly. The ACID test, of course, is to see your data appearing on the map. Head for the Find Us Sensor link here on the homepage to reveal this full map. You can zoom in to investigate. 
the sensors appear as hexagons. Select the aspect you wish to see from this list. The hexagons show the sensors streaming relevant data. Click on the sensor of interest to center the map. The sensor list appears here with an explanation here. Clicking on this plus expands the display to further graphs. Try some well-established sites to see the extent of these impressive displays or alternatively click on this link to reveal this. To save you copying it out, I've included it in the list below in the comments. This concludes this brief introduction. I hope it's been of some use and is the first step in you developing your own community.